uh, thank you to everyone who is able to attend in person. We're so happy to see you. Thank you to all of our virtual viewers. We're excited that you're uh, joining us this morning. For anyone who can't join this morning, please know this will be available on demand on Seed World's uh, various publications. Uh, so we're looking forward to getting lots of engagement for this exciting session. Um, first things first, my name is Sonia Begeman. I'm the editorial director here at Seed World Group. I am thrilled to be joining you today at this Seed World sponsored seminar, The Seed World of Precision Breeding. Um, I also am super excited to introduce this great panel of experts that we have here. To my immediate right is Fanley Chow. She is ASTA's Vice President of Scientific Affairs and Policy. Prior to this, she was the Ag Biotech Advisor to the Secretary of Ag. She has more than one decade of experience in Ag Biotech and Trade. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Sonia. And to her right is Diego Riso. He is the Executive Director of the Uruguayan Breeders Association and Secretary General of the Seed Association of the Americas. With Uruguayan breeders, he's responsible for developing royalties collection systems and enforcing plant breeders' rights. And finally, from halfway across the world, joining us virtually is Sabi Rutner, and he joined the International Seed Federation in 2015 as a regulatory affairs manager. Prior to this, was he, he was Secretary General of the Hungarian Seed Association. So to say the least, we have a lot of knowledge sitting with us here today and sitting with us virtually. Thank you guys so much for joining. Now, we're going to take a deep dive into new breeding techniques. And as all of you here and all of you watching virtually know, these new breeding techniques have a lot of potential. But they're also kind of under fire, so to speak. There's a lot of people who don't maybe understand exactly what the science is. They confuse it with genetically modified organisms. There's, there's some uncertainty here. And policies are being created sometimes, sometimes based, based on, on that uncertainty. So let's take some time to get to understand these policies and regulations you know, about new breeding techniques, and then a real deep dive into what that means globally for seed trade, food security, and, and the like. So I think let's start actually with Fan Lee. Can you tell me what's going on in the United States in terms of policy and regulations around new breeding techniques? Sure, thank you, Sonia. And um, this is a very exciting and I think critical time for us to think about from a regulatory perspective, how we're gonna bring new product to market. So in the, in the US, we have three federal agencies that regulate or have some purview over products of new breeding techniques. And they are in the process of modernizing what I would say a 30 year old framework and regulatory processes. And this modernization has been happening under many, many administrations. Uh, and it's been very consistent. You know, we need to have regulations that fit for purpose, that's science based and risk proportionate, um, that adjusts as we accumulating more experience and more scientific knowledge. And also that does not prevent innovation from occurring. So this is kind of the regulatory policy that's occurring. And with USDA being the first to finalize the revision, it, it, they are creating some room for these new innovations and for products from these innovations to come on board with the appropriate regulatory oversight. So, so certain products that look like is similar to conventional bread products, are not regulated, right? And I say not regulated, it's not regulated from a, from a technology <coughs> perspective, but all food from plant breeding, from plant varieties are regulated. We have general food safety and general environmental safety regulations that always apply. So when we talk about regulation, we're very talking about a very small subset of regulations. Um, so this is kind of regulatory policy, but I think the bigger picture policy about food security, sustainability, ag sustainability, climate adaptation in the ag space, and also nutritional sustainability is very much tied together. Right? To, to achieve these bigger policy goals, we need really appropriate regulatory approaches as well. So I think this is a really good time where you know, the policy objectives from a bigger perspective and the regulatory um, work of modernizing our system is going hand in hand. So in the next few years, I think it'll be really interesting to see how that develop in the US. There's still some some room to go, I guess. We're for not sure quite there there's yet. There's some room to go because we're waiting for EPA. They put out a proposed rule that take a very similar approach to USDA's, but that's not finalized. So we're, we're, we're looking forward to, to that to being finalized. And finally, with FDA being the third uh, leg of the stool, we need to see how they are going to be looking um, towards these new products. Mm -hmm. It's. It's gonna be really interesting to watch yes. that over the next couple of years. Now, Sabi, I know uh, with the International Seed Federation, you're not covering just one country, you're covering 
many of them. Um, I'd like to kind of take a focus right now on the European Union because they're a critical trade partner for so many countries. So talk to me about what you're hearing from the European Union in terms of their novel genomic techniques, as they call them. What's, what's going on there in terms of how they're regulating or how they're categorizing these breeding techniques? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia. Um, indeed, ISF is following it, but we do it together with our regional association partner, Euroseeds, and, and some of the local uh, national associations. They, so they are the ones who are, who are putting a lot of efforts uh, in, into these discussions. And uh, yeah, those people who are following this, this topic, and not even closely, but just uh, vaguely, I think uh, everybody a little bit knows about the, uh, the history. So that, uh, um, and because of Europe is very important uh, in terms of uh, um, seed export import and also the uh, import of, of agricultural products and, and foods. I think it's, uh, it's very important uh, to know what will happen with the future of, of, uh, of genome editing or, or MBTs or PBI, however we call them. So a um, little bit back to the, um, the history. We know that in, in 2018, uh, there was a decision of the European Court of Justice, uh, which basically put an equitation mark between uh, uh, targeted mutagenesis and, 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 and classical uh, transgenic uh, events. So today, the situation is that um, 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 any um, products which has been created by, by genome editing, for instance, they, they consider GMO, so they have the same strict uh, regulatory and, and, and pre-market assessment and approval as, as GMOs. And uh, this was not really a, a surprise because uh, um, the GMO Act of, of, of the EU is, is dates back to 2001 on the knowledge of the, uh, the, the, the late 90s or mid 90s. So I think this was, uh, this interpretation, legal interpretation was, was, was quite uh, known because there are a lot of things happened since that which the uh, the European legislative system, and especially this uh, GM Act, is, it doesn't really deal with, doesn't kept up uh, with the processes. It hasn't been reviewed uh, since then. So it was a kind of uh, ultimate um, outcome of, of these uh, legal analysis. But then, of course, it was a huge outroar from, from the scientific committee for the food egg value chain, uh, the public sector, but also the decision makers start to think about it. Hey, OK, we have this decision, but uh, how we can uh, implement it? And uh, this basically triggered uh, a study. A European Commission uh, made a study. It uh, had uh, several uh, stakeholders consultation, mainly based in Europe. and. Uh, in the end, in April, uh, they, they released this, uh, this study, which are very, I would say, very positive, positive outcomes. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but basically the, the essence of this study was that the, uh, the, the current legislative framework is, is not, for, not fit for purpose. There are a lot of concerns regarding the implementation. Um, uh, it it's can hinder innovation. So there are very good messages in this study. And which basically somehow triggered the uh, a kind of review process of of the uh, of the uh, of the legislative framework. So in this September, uh, the the European Commission published a, a roadmap. So basically, it's a, a kind of timeline how they foresee this this uh, this um, uh, review procedure. And basically, the big, biggest milestone is that in, in next year, in, in, the, in the second quarter, they aim to make a, a broad public consultation. And uh, a year after, uh, so it's uh, early or mid-32, uh, uh, so 2032, they, they would like to have a legislative proposal. So this is, this is more or less certain. But afterwards, obviously, uh, this needs to be discussed on a, on a political level. So there will be a discussion with the European Parliament and the European Council with the different ministers and, and MEPs. And uh, this process and, and the outcome is obviously uh, much less predictable. <laughs> so, but the essence is that uh, something has started. And then what we hoped for, that, uh, that um, they, they said that this status quo is it's just not to be, it's not possible to maintain. Uh, Europe needs innovation. Europe have this farm fork uh, strategy, which is quite ambitious. Uh, so uh, a farmer needs new tools to, to meet those, those goals.
Absolutely. And just to underscore what you said there, things are starting. It's not finished yet, but it seems like things might be moving in a positive direction in Europe. And surprisingly enough, the farm to fork strategy, which has been uh, one that's not exactly popular with a lot of scientists, is possibly opening some doors for those novel genomic techniques to be used. So uh, really interesting stuff, Sabi. We'll come back to you in just a bit to talk a little bit, uh, to see if you've heard anything from Asia and Africa. I want to ask Diego. Now, South America is kind of a little ahead of Europe and the United States in terms of actually having a decision made about new breeding techniques. So um, obviously, South America is a lot of different countries. But maybe give me a, a high-level view of what's going on uh, in terms of those technologies there. OK, thank you very much. and. Um, Regarding your first comments about there could be some misunderstanding between GM and gene editing, uh, I would like to congratulate you guys from SeedWorld for this initiative because we need a lot of communication, not only within our seed family, but also out of the box. And it's a huge challenge for us to communicate well the benefits and how safe are these technologies. So being this said, in the, you know, SAA gathers the, the Americas, but uh, being family here, I will uh, leave North America to her, so I will concentrate on uh, LATAM. And uh, yes, as, as you said, Sonia, um, many countries have already regulation in place, and that is very good news for us. Um, our LATAM region has been leading, I will say, worldwide discussion. Uh, Argentina was one of the first, if not the first country in the world that have a uh, regulation in place. But after that, uh, other countries like uh, Brazil, Colombia, Paraguay, Chile, and very recently in Central America, Guatemala and Honduras. So this country already have regulation in place that um, could allow companies to present the technologies or the products uh, to be released uh, to the market or to be released for other kind of um, goals like uh, research or testing or whatever. And um, although quite diverse, at the end of the day, they have something in common, which is the, the definition of the Cartagena protocol. So if no foreign uh, DNA is found on the final product, then this product will co be considered non-GM. So it's not a GM product, then it's a conventional one. So you don't need to go through any regulatory process, okay? But if during the assessment they, they conclude that this is a GM, then you will go through all the process of, uh, of the GM regulations. But, um, so far, things uh, seem to be uh, working. Some companies have already, I will say, challenged this system with some products, more to see how the system works than to release a final product in the market. And, um, and so far, we are receiving uh, good feedback on how this system are working. So good news so far. I was going to say, everything I've read, it's very favorable of what you're doing in South America. It's, it's science-driven. It is, it is enabling breeders to do what they need to do to supply farmers with seed that will help you know, feed animals and feed the world. So very exciting to hear that. Absolutely. Um, you know, back to you, Sabi. Um, you know, kind of there's a lot going on right now in Africa and Asia. Can you give us kind of a, a high level brief overview of kind of what you're hearing from those two, you know, large continents? <laughs> I believe you're still on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. This was the last time I did it, I promise. Um, so yeah, indeed, these are important regions, especially Asia for, for vegetable uh, seed export import and also other commodities, and um, they are catching up. So um, I don't want to go into details because we don't have time for it, just to just really briefly mention a few countries of, of which is our interest and also where, where things are developing. So maybe starting with, with Japan and Australia. So um, both uh, countries had their, their policies in place, um, relatively supportive policies. So some of the, uh, the application are put out of the scope of, of, of the GM legislation. So they, they, uh, 
considered as, as, as conventional products, mainly the um, um, gene emitted products where you have uh, small um, uh, modifications, small alternation and deletion insertion, uh, both in, 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 uh, in Australia and, and, and Japan. But uh, in still Australia, uh, the things uh, haven't stopped here because they are reviewing their um, Gene Technology Act and they try to make it future proof. So hopefully there will be more, um, I would say, allowing policies in, in, in Australia. And if you are speaking about Australia, they have a common um, uh, food standard agency with, with New Zealand and they are also uh, revising um, their, their legislation. They want to have a, like a new definition from, from genetic product. And it seems that they also using a kind of risk tiered approach. Uh, so uh, certainly there's a good hope that uh, some of the food products uh, will be exempted, uh, genetic food product exempted from, from the biotech regulation. And it's important because so far New Zealand has a very, uh, um, I would say, uh, conservative approach to, to, to genome editing. Um, moving uh, to other countries, uh, there are very is positive developments in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, Philippines, Thailand, and, and Singapore, uh, they started the discussing uh, uh, their, and their legislative framework. Uh, uh, the Philippines already had their uh, draft guideline, and Singapore also um, um, uh, published their draft guideline. Uh, with many positive elements, uh, uh, pretty much uh, looking for the same or, or thriving the same area to make this kind of regular trigger between whether the product contain foreign GM or foreign gene or, or, or not. Uh, less promising use from, from other important countries like uh, China, India, and, and South Korea. In all countries, uh, there are discussions in place um, quite a long time ago, uh, and, but the direction is still uh, really much unknown. Uh, from India, we've, we've seen a, a concrete guidelines, but uh, they are too much focusing on the process, and it, needs, it seems to be rather restrictive for, for this foresight, so we'll see what will happen to them. With Africa, um, a far less uh, development at the moment. Um, there are two countries which are positive. They have a adopted and almost adopted policies, one in, in Nigeria and uh, in Kenya. And also, they are pretty much following this, uh, this uh, good path of, of novel genetic combination as a regulatory trigger. And recently, we just got a very negative news from uh, South Africa, which is interesting because South Africa is always a kind of uh, pro-technology, pro-biotech country, and they were one of the like-minded countries who were supporting this uh, um, risk proportionate regulation of, 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 uh, of genome editing. But uh, as of 1st of December, uh, they put, they, um, they basically, the regulatory agency um, um, made a notification. Uh, they haven't uh, changed their regulation, biotech regulation, but they, 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 they made a statement that basically all um, uh, genome edited products uh, need to be uh, seen as, as, as GMO, so they also have to go through the same uh, pre-market assessment, uh, safety assessment as, uh, as, as biotech products. So in a nutshell, these, these are, are the happening in, um, in Asia and, and, and Africa. Thank you so much for that overview, Sabi. It's unfortunate to hear what's happening in South Africa because uh, it's just handicapping this potential technology <laughs> even more. Um, you know, I've actually been reporting on this type of technology for probably five years or, you know, quite a while now. And uh, it's exciting to think of the potential because I had a breeder tell me once we could go from seven years to two years to market. That's incredible. That type of growth, that type of, you know, getting things into farmers' hands is just exciting. As we hear about, you know, what's going on in, in Africa, South Africa, we hear about what's going on, um, you know, in EU and, and some of these policies that maybe are a little bit more negative, you know, how, how is that concerning to, to you guys from, you know, you know, putting your scientist's hat on right now? Why is this so concerning for you? And family, I'll start with you. I'm sure, sure. I think Savi mentioned this too from, the seed industry is very integrated around the world, especially with US and Europe. And it's not just seed trade, but also seed movement from our seed production perspective. 
So for, for, our, for our industry to thrive, we really need alignment internationally on this. And I think, you know, um, Diego mentioned too, many different countries have slightly different approaches, and we appreciate that. But I think we really need to have consistency in scope. When is it in, when is it out? And in consistency in how they apply their implementation so that at the end, regardless of what their trigger or their regulatory processes is, we have consistent answers. So that would create some predictability in this space for the seed industry. But it's not just the industry, it's also the public sector researchers as well. So as we looked for towards Africa, towards Southeast Asia, you know, one of the biggest um, research breeding programs that supply the farmers there is the CG centers, right? So how are they going to take advantage of, of these technologies from a food safety perspective for, for crops that, you know, to be honest, the seed industry may not be focusing on? And how does international alignment benefit you know, farmers in those areas? And those, I think those are really important questions. Because at the end of the day, these are tools, and the tools is trying to achieve some objective. And those objectives of ag sustainability, food security, nutritional security is shared. And I think if you look at Zavi's background, it's in, you know, those little, little um, color in the back, those are those shared SDG goals around the world. So, so these things are, are tools to reach those goals. So as you put a barriers, be it regulatory barriers, be it unjustified trade barriers, <coughs> it's, it's, prevent, it's barriers to reaching those goals. So that's my perspective. I think just one thing, because Zavi just gave us a really great overview of what's happening from a regulatory perspective, but USDA actually have a great resource. So every year, uh, many of their foreign post are required to put out an, an annual report on agricultural biotechnology. So they include a section on there about new breeding techniques, both from a research development and commercial development perspective, but also a uh, regulatory development process. So in December is when they put out their annual report. So if you go into your favor search engine, type in USDA, FAS, G-A-I-N-S, the spaces, uh, biotechnology, ag biotechnology, you'll pull up different reports for different countries and you can get more details. It's a great resource. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I'll, I'll find that link and actually include it in the Seed World article we do. That's a great resource. And Diego, I'm curious because, you know, where, where you live down in Latin America, um, you guys have just, you know, science-based approaches right now and you're hearing these policies that don't lean on science. What are your concerns? Well, actually, friendly science will apply, I will say, to the world, not only to U.S. and uh, North America. It's a, it was a very good answer, friendly. And uh, I will add that here, that um, what it could concern us a little bit is what with the other countries that do not have regulation in place. Because we, we do know those that already have, so far seems to be that it will work. Uh, but what will happen with other countries that they don't have or they are under discussion? Um, because alignment is needed. And for our country that we are food and feed producers, so it's not only about seed trade, it's also about commodity trade, because at the end of the day, this always will impact our markets. And um, we, we need to be aligned uh, within our region because what we have in common, I will say, in the Americas region is that we are all exporting countries, commodity exporting countries. And um, it worries us what could happen in other countries that import our products, how they will accept or not or recognize or not this kind of, uh, of technologies. So we as a, at SIA, we are working close to those countries that do not have regulation in place to see how we can bring them together with those that already have and share experience. And then uh, let's see how the future looks. Yeah, it sounds like exciting work for sure. It is. Now, you guys both opened up a bag of worms that I'm going to release on Sabi here. So they mentioned, you know, global trade. So, you know, you work with international. I mean, you work with everyone. So, you know, what are your concerns as they relate to global trade? And when I say global trade, 
Obviously, food is a huge part of what we're exporting and importing, but we're talking to seed companies here. We're also moving seed from country to country. So what do these, these different policies and this you know, non-consistent policy making, what does it mean for our global trade, Sabi? Yeah, I think the, uh, the best word is, is destruction, right? So, yeah. um, I mean, most, most friendly and, and, and Diego very uh, capture the, uh, the necessity of, of, of alignment. And uh, what it makes it difficult that basically every country has like a little bit different history, how, how they put together their biotech framework, which, uh, which are already a challenge. So we always said that it's like regulatory harmonization is, is, is not really possible because of this uh, historical um, um, elements, but at least uh, try to agree on, on the consistent criteria. So what will be the criteria where governments will decide uh, to regulate something as a GM or, or not? The other challenge that um, in many areas of, of the seed and the global seed business, there are intergovernmental organizations uh, who gave some kind of regulatory oversight. At least they, they set some standards, like uh, with variety protection, we have UPOV, with the seed certification, we have OECD, but for for the global um, 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 for the global uh, uh, regulatory framework of of, of uh, genome editing or new breeding techniques, uh, we don't have such. So the the only way, as as Diego mentioned, is to get together to to government to talk. And this is what ISF did in the past, and this is what uh, national seed association and regional seed association are, are continuously doing because this is the only way to to achieve. Uh, some uh, some kind of of, um, of of alignment, and uh, um, and indeed we are not only the seed sector who who will um, who will on whom will has a has a kind of impact in, in the future. It will impact the the entire uh, commodity um, exchange uh, and trade, and also uh, the, the food products. And uh, um, this is why. Uh, what we are doing, we try to engage with the uh, with the value chain stakeholders, uh, um, and uh, but uh, because today more or less we can have their their support because obviously they are interested to have a kind of uh, um, regulatory framework. Then they don't have any uh, compliance issues, so they don't have any any certainty. So they are. They're, at the moment, uh, especially if you are speaking about the green trade, where we have ISF has a, a quite good, good relation, we, we still have have their support um, in terms of the, the policy discussion. But uh, this is always in, in their mind that um, this is until is the case when they feel that there is a chance that their products will be uh, seamlessly transported all around the world. And uh, maybe this is one of the reasons that we, we don't see too many products at the moment at the market. So we have uh, two products, uh, bo both of them, like we all know this is a high oleic uh, soybean and the high gaba tomato in Japan. Uh, both of them are a kind of niche product for, for, for niche uh, markets because uh, uh, companies are not ready yet to, to, to basically commercialize something with, with a more global relevance, which again, uh, they can ship all around the world because of this uh, regulatory uncertainty. So it's it's truly impacts uh, uh, trade, and it's at the moment it impacts uh, the ratio of of innovation of of new products. Absolutely, yeah. It's hard to want to invest in something when you don't know if you're actually going to be able to sell it to the farmer or if the the food product will be able to be sold as well. It's a pretty tough uh, tough situation there. Now, I, I asked Sabi about trade. I don't want to leave you guys out. When you guys think about trade, global trade from a seed and food perspective, you know, what are your what are your thoughts, your concerns? Um, you know, what are your I hope this happens kind of thing. And, and Diego, I'll start with you. Well, I think somehow I have already answered this uh, regarding the, the impact of trade. So, so far we cannot measure it, but we can expect, um, honestly, I don't know what we can expect. Our fear is that if we don't find alignment between exporting and importing countries, uh, that will be a huge trade disruption. So we are in the early stages now. So this is the moment 
to come together and dis discuss policies. This is the moment to come together and to provide guarantees. Let's say in the region, in our region, in the Americas, having so many countries with regulations in place, how can these countries at the different levels, not only regulatory, but also I will say uh, policy, um, trade offices, uh, trying to, to develop or design a strategy on how can we provide guarantees on our regulatory frameworks <laughs> that are based on science, that are safe, that those products that will hit the market one day are safe. And this is the, the, the right moment to do so, because sooner or later, we will have products, for sure. And, um, and, and probably this process will be much faster than the GM, which takes years uh, to find an agreement and a consensus. So far, there is a huge mar trading market of GMs. So this will come Zoom. So I will invite countries to come together from our region, and that's part of our goal as SAA, to help to serve as a platform to have discussions and see how we can show other countries around the world that imports our products to trust on our regulatory frameworks. Absolutely. Fanley, what would you add? Yeah, I think the dynamics changing a bit. I think you know, the, the, we fall into this, this um, this kind of uh, paradigm of like thinking about these products coming out from new breeding techniques in the context of classic gene te technology. And I think we need to kind of step back that from, from that. And, I, and, and that is happening around the world. So in classic GM, you have traditional importers and traditional exporters, and you all know who they are. But in this new, new technology, new breeding technology space, that is changing. As Avi mentioned, you know, Japan is a leader in this from mm -hmm putting products out the market. So I think that dynamic is going to change. But from a trade disruption perspective, we have lessons learned. We have classic GM and the trade disruption that has caused because of unnecessary regulatory barriers. And you know, we have to step back a bit and think about why are we regulating? Why does government regulate? They regulate to provide safety. So from a, an even classic GM perspective, we have proven over and over again as a community that these are safe products. So these trade barriers based on unscientific science is need to be removed. So I think looking forward, there's a recognition of that uh, around the world and in countries, and it's a hard thing. You know, when's the last time you all changed your mind about something that you held? Uh, so, so I think uh, from a industry perspective, working through ISF with SAA, we're really trying to bring the government together, think about this in a new way. So we're at a juncture, as Diego says, where we can make changes, where we can take lessons learned and think about how we, what we can do uh, from an industry perspective, from a government perspective, to really reduce those barriers that are not science-based. And I think that is very important as we look forward um, you know, to, to move these products, bring innovation onto, this, onto the, the marketplace. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting as I look at what Canada's doing, actually, Health Canada, they're they're looking at the process and they're trying to decide, you know, no final decision yet. We're still waiting, but they are making that process-based or not process-based decision, a product-based decision. You know, what is the end product? Is it something that could be developed through conventional breeding? And uh, I think you're right, separating that idea, you know, it's it's not the same as the GM. It's not not the same situation. It's it's a pretty critical conversation and one that's hard to have. You know. One thing I'm curious about, and, and Sabi alluded to this, is, you know, right now there's not a lot of this technology on the market. So, you know, maybe talk to me a little bit about what technologies you know of on the market, you know, just a high level, you know, where they're being used. But then really, what will it take for this technology to, you know, come of age, to become a, a wide, you know, a widely used technique that, that is beneficial to seed companies and to farmers? And family, I'll just start with you. I think if you look at this, you know, we don't have a lot of commercial products, right? And, and Zavi mentioned that. Um, but if you look at the research uh, frame, kind of further up the pipeline of R&D, it is very, very exciting. And because this technology, these tools, and I keep saying these tools because it's still plant breeding at the mm -hmm. end of the day, right? We are just integrating this new set of tools into the paradigm of plant breeding. So all the things we have done in the past, 
selection, elimination, and field test. That's still happening. This is not like some magic thing. I threw in a test tube and boom, I'm not doing any of that other stuff. So if you look at the R&D, this technology has been integrated into breeding programs for all crop varieties. Right, so you're seeing that across the board. And so, you know, Zavi says, oh, we have some niche products. Like if you look at classic GM, I would say that is a niche product market because it's only like certain row crops. It's, we wanna see this applied across veg, horticulture, animals, that's occurring too. So what's critical is what's gonna come out, right? So it's not a uh, R&D pipeline, it's a funnel. We have all this innovation, not in the US, in China, around the world, in, in Asia, in South America. So this funnel is gonna come down and it's a selection funnel. What is gonna come out at the end of that funnel from a commercial space? And regulatory barriers is a, is a negative pressure selection. Um, so I think we're, we're gonna, you know, the science is there too, you know, so all these wonderful lab ideas or a few ideas may not come out. Um, so we need to kind of think about how, we're, how tight we're gonna make that tunnel from a selection pressure perspective, where do we have that control? Science, for sure, you know, that's gonna move forward. But regulatory barrier, that's a huge thing. And, and there's economic studies about that. Absolutely. Now, Sabi, you know, what do you, what do you see it's gonna take, or, you know, when do you expect to see this technology become, you know, quote unquote, mainstream, if you will? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And uh, the other thing is, this is a, a continuously developing uh, technology. So there are new and new methods are, are coming up, uh, I wouldn't say day by day, but uh, uh, pretty frequently there is a new solution uh, which can which can make uh, other application, uh, I would say even obsolete, um, uh, because, because right now we can do modification without inducing double strand in the DNA. So I think yeah, we don't see where it ends. So it, this is this is we see this a huge potential, and we have huge, huge expectation. But it's still uh, under under development. And uh, <clears throat> one of the the good indication, as as Fanley said, is to look at what's happening on, on the research area. So if we if you see the, uh, the 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 publication, there are several thousands of of publication which are using CRISPR cas Of course, part of them are. Mm -hmm. Uh, proof of concept type of research and, and model researches, but if we even zoom into the uh, the market oriented research, which could yield the product in the end, is uh, two or three hundred already. Uh, there are more than sixty crops uh, are involved in in these studies uh, in in more than thirty countries. So this is really shows the magnitude and the interest of of, of using these technologies and. Uh, you also see the diverse range of, of stakeholders, it's pub, private, public, uh, small, local, multinational. So uh, you, you, can, you can name it. So it's really, uh, maybe it's a common sense, but it's pretty much democratized the, uh, the research area for, for plant breeding. And, uh, and, and indeed, uh, how it's evolved, uh, the, the, the regulatory framework will, will have a, a big say on it and how much uh, these products could be utilized in the future because indeed the uh, the potentials are are huge. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I had someone once tell me in an interview that these breeding technologies level the playing field from a, a mid-sized breeder to multinational. The potential is there for anyone to make big advancements, and that's really exciting. So I'm so glad you mentioned that, Sabi. And what about you, Diego? And uh, what you just said is. It's true, we can see it already. And uh, you can see, if you go, let's say to Latin American countries where almost no GM were developed, uh, I say almost because some few were, but uh, here you already see in different either universities or national research institute or medium-sized company, they are already working on this. And um, what it has been amazing in the last years uh, since all this discussion started, and um, a person that uh, travels and uh, goes to different congresses or events and, and trade shows, and you see, like this one, of course, and, and you see different companies uh, wanting to learn about these technologies and about these tools, and then after they learn, it's about, okay, how they can get license for this, how to manage the IP. It's like uh, learning lessons every day. Um, so it's, it, the question is not only 
when will we have the first products in the market is the process for all these medium-sized companies or research institutes or universities on how to handle all this. And, um, and, I, and I think uh, we are learning a lot, a lot. And also you see the, the network behind this um, because these tools are being used by many that it is very important to have networks, connections, on, uh, on how to benefit, enhance the benefits between these different uh, stakeholders. And, um, and one of the things is also that uh, it's challenging our agendas at the seed associations. So PBI, plant breeding innovation, has uh, become a very important portion of our agendas. And if they are an important portion of our agenda, that means resources devoted to that. And, um, and on the other side, it, it, the IP framework, because you have IP, intellectual property behind the things. And it's also a challenge, this framework. It says how this new technology fits within the current IP framework. So lessons learned every day, network increasing. And I, I think, I don't know when these products will be massive in the market, but I think it will be faster than GM for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to pause for just a second because we have about 20 minutes left of this session. I want to remind anyone who's here in person, if you have questions, there are question cards on your table. Feel free to fill those out and take them to Aiden. Aiden will raise his hand. Um, or wave him down, he'll run over to you and uh, pick him up as well. Or if you'd prefer, we have a microphone here where you can also ask your question. To our virtual viewers, there is an ask button at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions, push that button. It'll send an email to Aiden, and Aiden will let me know what those questions are. We are uh, excited to engage with our audience. And I think we actually have our first question. Directed to panel, my question is, what are your thoughts regarding epigenetic tools for variety slash germplasm improvement with respect to acceptance? Can you repeat that? I don't think we got the first part of it. What are your thoughts regarding epigenetic tools for variety slash germplasm improvement with respect to acceptance? Just for me. <laughs> So I think this this clearly illustrates where the science meets regulation, right? And how and and coming coming out of the lab for me when I joined the government, I was like, holy moly, you cannot make regulation based on technology because that's going to change today. Epigenetics, tomorrow, tilling, the next day, you 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 cannot keep the speed of science is slow. For those of you working in science, the speed of regulation and changing regulation is glacial. Right? So I think this is this is why, from a uh, from the perspective of the state associations, when we are advocating in front of our government governments right now, this is an opportunity to make our regulation future proof, adaptable. If you cannot be adaptable right now, how do you build in adaptability? And I think that's one, you know, to just give a plug to my own employer, employer USDA's rules, it's not the best, it's sausage making, right? The sausage is not pretty, um, but there's the building of process for that regulation to improve over time to make that adaptability more, more streamlined, more flexible. So that's what we need to think about. So, you know, I think every time that comes around, we're testing it, right? And I think that's what's happening in South America. And I hand it over to Diego. It's like they, they put a framework together. Now things are testing it. And how, do, how does the regulatory process see the government's respond to that test is, is critical. It is critical. And uh, I like your words of future proof and adaptable, definitely. And uh, we are now in the process, uh, as I said before, is challenging the systems. And by challenging, I mean, okay, let's present some products that probably won't be uh, for market use, but see how a product developed with gene editing tools will go through or will flow through the process. 
and see definitely what we're looking for is the final results, if they are regulated by SGM or not. And so far, these challenges have been successful for the seed industry a interest yes. on how they have been working. So maybe I think uh, Zavi probably talk about this too, is like we also get kind of stuck to talking about technologies. And so what we really need to focus on is the final product. Yep. At the end of the day, it's no plant breeding. We have a plant variety, a plant variety that comes out. There's a history of the breeding process, putting out safe products, full stop. And I think, you know, when, when we talk to Zavi and ISF, when we talk about these things, we, we have to, we keep coming back to that to remind ourselves that we're talking about technologies, but at the end of the day, we have a history of safe use for plant breeding. And how does that you know, inform decision-making? Absolutely. Sabi, what would you add to that? Um, I think lots of great stuff here, but the international perspective. Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree what I heard from, from Diego and Fan Lee. And um, using these technologies, uh, we are, we are learning much more about, about the genome itself, how it, how it behaves. Um, we are realizing that what we are doing now, it's, it's already happened in, in, in nature spontaneously. So there are a lot of incredible stuff that are happening, which is we cannot really uh, uh, regulate on, a, on an application and process process basis because uh, this, is, this is just not, not possible. And if we lock us uh, in, in a certain area, it is very difficult to move on. We already have this kind of experience. Uh, it's, for instance, with some of this, this uh, uh, Southeast Asian uh, um, regulatory thinking, they, they still try to capture this area from this SDN1, SDN2, SDN3 of, of mindset. But we already know that, that there are applications which, which you cannot categorize like this if you are speaking about prime editing or, or base editing or some kind of uh, chromosomal rearrangement. This is You cannot classify like this. So... So I think uh, this this is the the only way to 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 look at the the outcome and uh, and, and try to compare it um, what has been already done by either conventional breeding or it's it's happening spontaneously in, in nature and then this is the only thing uh, you can you can speak about uh, uh, risk you can speak about safety because because then you said okay we already done this or it already happened this. Uh, in nature and, uh, and nothing catastrophic happens. So why we should uh, have uh, additional regulation? I heard somebody a very good thing that we shouldn't regulate something just because we can. <laughs> we, we, need, we should regulate only because uh, there, there is something need to be regulated. There is some real risk associated with it. So I think it's a, it's a very good mindset. And as, as finally said, uh, we are started at ISF a kind of uh, horizon scanning project with the, with the leader, leadership of, of Bernice uh, Slatsky. And basically, the aim was first to, to educate ourselves to see how and how the, uh, the science is developing. We consulted private public scientists, what is their view of the future, and then test against our, our criterias and also uh, how these criterias, if these are still applicable. And this is still something governments can follow when they are... Um, when they are making their, their, their policy decisions. And uh, we would like to use this material in the near future exactly for this purpose, to, to speak about this. It's not really gray areas. It's gray areas because the, the, the current legislative framework doesn't reflect it, but to try to, 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 to speak them in a, in a, in a, yeah, in a way that uh, uh, regulators understand. They can have uh, a trust uh, in, in, in the science and, and the development, and they can build it in their, in their future uh, policy frameworks. Thank you, thank you. You know, listening to us, or listening to you guys, rather not me, you guys, the experts talking about this, I'm hearing a lot of, we need clear communication. We need to be talking to regulators. We need to be doing, you know, we need to let people know more than just the science part. We, we have to be good communicators. So uh, kind of a two-part question here. Um, one is, you know, what's the feedback that you're hearing from seed companies? Because you all work with a lot of different seed companies in this industry um, about various proposed policies. Um, and two, you know, thinking about the fact that there are some kind of more negative policies that are being proposed, do seed companies have a voice and should they be using it with those regulators and with the people who are creating that policy? And Diego, you, you look like you, oh, you want to go first. Thank you. The industry, yes, it has a voice, definitely. 
uh, either national, regional, or international level. If the voice could be louder, I think so. And for the voice to be louder, I think we need a, to come together. Um, and here perhaps it's because I have the, the seed association hat. So I am answering it from a seed association perspective. And um, we need our members, the seed industry and the seed industry is big, small, medium sized company, but also as I said, research institutes, university, all those involved in plant breeding. And of course, seed production, seed trade, those are our members. And uh, for the boys to be louder, we need all of them seated around the same table. And um, with uh, these plant breeding innovation tools that uh, are being used by all these um, members, it will provide us a better representation if we have all the voices around the same table. So you ask if, uh, if they have a voice, yes, they have, but we could make it uh, our voice heard if we have more representation. So we do not represent few companies. We represent the entire seed industry. And I mean, nationally, a seed association represents the entire seed uh, uh, industry. So we are doing that work. I think we are in the right track. And uh, because now they see when I mean is medium sized company or research, national research institute, even they have public funds for plant breathing and they use their tools. The regulatory system within the government is a different area of the research one. And sometimes the researchers do not get in contact with the regulatory bodies. So through the seed association, we are helping them to connect. Incredible or not, but it's that really happens. And um, so they ha we have a voice. And the first question, the first part of the question was? Uh, what are you hearing from the seed companies you're working with about you know, either using the technology or their fears about using the technology because of regulatory barriers? Mm -hmm. Of course, there are fears because if they invest so much in research before hitting the market and they don't have clear and transparent rules, it's, difficult, it's very difficult to invest when you don't know if you will be able to sell your product or which will be the cost to put your products in the market. So of course, there are some worries but or concerns, but did have not avoid uh, development in research. And um, and something I would like to, to highlight here is the learning process. I already mentioned, but there is, there is a process where medium-sized company needs to learn the new rules of the market. They are trying to have access to these new technologies. In some, in some ways, they also need to start uh, learning how to negotiate license because there, are, there is IP behind these this things also. So it's a huge challenge. And uh, seed associations can also serve as a platform to help um, some companies on how to move forward on, this, on these uh, discussions. Absolutely. I think that licensing piece you just mentioned is something that maybe isn't always thought about, but developing those new techniques, that, that technology needs to be protected. Uh, the, the product, anyway, needs to be protected. So very good point yes. there. Now, Sabi, what would you add? You know, what have you heard from, um, from seed companies about their, their enthusiasm or fears? And then, you know, what would you say to using your voice about this technology? Yeah, I think I actually I try to be like, Concrete because for this area, uh, Euroseeds uh, released a, a study, I think a, a year ago, when they they asked their members, the European plant breeders. So they have uh, 62 companies, um, a small, medium, and large. And what is their take on uh, on 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 uh, NBTs or uh, or or genome editing? And uh, one of the first questions were because we know what is the uh, the regulatory situation in in in, in Europe. So they ask uh, whether they do research, uh, even if the, the regulatory um, 
uh, arena is pretty negative. And this question was asked before this commission study. So back then it was really, uh, uh, really dark, dark, uh, the situation in Europe. And uh, the, the interesting thing was that, of course, multinational companies, uh, they do research, medium sized companies, uh, more than seven, more than 80% of the medium sized companies uh, do MBT related research. But even the small companies, uh, half of them, uh, despite the regulatory um, uh, framework uh, in Europe, they do research. So it, it shows two things. Uh, the, uh, the breeding sector is, is fully international. Even the smallest companies have, uh, have an international uh, uh, outreach. They, they exchange germplasm, they are in breeding process. So, so even if in a country a situation like uh, not so Brighton, um, uh, they do research. The other thing, they, they hope that it's, it's, it's going to change. And the, the, sex question, the next question was that, okay, what will uh, happen that the, the regulatory framework would change? Uh, and in the small size companies from 50%, uh, they, they jump to, to 70%. So if their regulatory framework would be uh, better, uh, even the small size companies, 70% of, with them would do research with, uh, with, with genome editing. So it it's really shows the, the huge interest from, from, from the companies and also the relevance and the importance of the, of the regulatory framework. Uh, for the second questions, I think, uh, Diego pretty well uh, summarized what is the role of, of uh, seed association, either national, regional, or, or international. We have to work uh, together. We are the voice of the seed sector. We are the ones who are, who are uh, the talking partners of, of, of governments or, or regional or international organizations. So uh, we have to do this job, and I think we do this job uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Absolutely. Now, family, I saved you for last intentionally because you are a member, you are with ASTA and this, this is ASTA. This is your people. These are, you're my people. And so as a national seed association, you know, ASTA, we always say we represent the seed industry from A to Z, right? The alfalfa to zucchini. And then I had another one for flowers to ASTA to Zeneca, to Zenia, right? So we, so for, from that perspective, um, we really need to look at this landscape from a very broad perspective. And, we, and, and to, to really think about how this technology can revolutionize across the board. And so if we look at um, productivity increases and yield increases and these kind of genetic gains that has occurred in a subset of crops and has not been fully realized in other sectors. And it, it, so, so for us, you know, it's how do, how do we democratize to make accessible that this technology occurs for all these companies that is such a broad, you know, that makes our, our, our dinner plates beautiful, but also delicious, right? So just not focusing on one part of our dinner plates. So I think research uh, investment is super important from a government perspective. So a lot of these smaller specialty crops is very much dependent on government uh, um, supported research, especially initially, right? Um, and then, so, so that, so I think, you know, we, we were very focused on regulations, so, because that's important to bring products to market, but, you know, if, God forbid, those are, those are overly restrictive, um, these technologies are still going to be used in research and still going to be used to really build the foundational understandings or increase foundational understandings of plant science. And that's going to be useful regard, regardless. Um, but we're hopeful that this is stayed there. Right, so we are hopeful that the re re regulatory framework is appropriate, so that you know the the company that's putting out alfalfa and the company that's putting out you know aster flowers every year can also use it and be able to meet that regulatory barrier, cross that regulatory barrier, and that's a huge calculus in the business model. Um, am I going to invest money? How much is going to cost me to to get this to market? And you know, different component of that. Uh, adds to it. And you know, if the classic GM regulations is added to that, that's a huge, huge investment that companies cannot, many of our small companies, the one that's making our plate beautiful and colorful cannot afford that. And, and that would be a huge shame from a science perspective, but also from a societal perspective. Absolutely. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today, but I think that's a great a great thing to end on there. Just this is this is a critical technology. So, uh, I first want to thank 
our panelists here for the fantastic job you guys did. This is a tough subject and it is moving. It is changing a lot and, and very quickly. So I appreciate your amazing insight. So thank you guys. Uh, and thank you to everyone who woke up bright and early with us at 7.15 this morning. Um, I am just so grateful to learn more about this. Uh, for anyone who wants to watch this on demand, because I will be re-watching re this, this will actually be a very special episode of our weekly series called Seed Speaks, which is brought to you by Seed World Group. Seed Speaks for this past season has been taking a deep dive into science under fire. We're taking a look at technologies that while we know in agriculture they're super beneficial, consumers, activists, political bodies, whatever you want to name it, um, they're, they're taking them under the microscope and they're picking them apart. And we wanted to take a dive into what, what we as scientists and what we as communicators can do to, uh, to really you know, encourage these technologies to be allowed and to be used. So that'll be posted today around noon central time on Seed World's Facebook, Seed World Group's YouTube, and our websites. So we hope you'll uh, watch it again. I know I will be. Guys, thank you so much. This was fantastic.